Let's, let's turn in our Bibles. Uh, we're going to the book of Mark, and I'm going to announce my subject, and then we're going to pray, and then we'll read. But I, I believe God wants to talk to us today. Amen. 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 Now, how many of you will do your very best today? Number one, I'm going to stay seated during the entire 30 minutes he preaches. I, the Walker family that used to go here, they're gone. Amen. So we don't have any more walkers. Number two, I'm going to preach with a preacher today. I'm going to, get, I'm going to receive this word. Amen. Because I believe if you'll do that, God will do something great for you. Amen. Hallelujah. I believe that. My, my subject today is this. His presence is everything. His presence is everything. Amen. Clap your hands to the Lord. You may be seated. His presence is everything. Mark chapter 2, verse 1. And again, everybody say, and again. He entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their heart, Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason you these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise, take up thy bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise, take up thy bed, go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all. Insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on, that, on this fashion. Verse 1 says that he again entered into Capernaum after some days. So if Jesus entered again into Capernaum, that means he had been there before. Would you look at what transpired on that previous visit to Capernaum? Mark chapter 1, verse 21. And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? May I pause here to say it's always an unclean spirit that says, Leave me alone. Always. Don't mess with me, preacher. Don't preach against my sin. I want to be where I am, and I want to be comfortable and left alone. Leave me alone, Jesus. You better pray to God he don't. I know who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. They were all amazed in so much that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. In verse 28, and immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. Jesus demonstrated power and authority over the kingdom of darkness when he cast out that evil spirit, and then his fame spread abroad. Verse 32 says, And at evening, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, them that were possessed with devils, and the entire city was gathered together at the door. Verse 34, And he healed many that were sick of divers diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. 
Then it says in verse 41 that Jesus healed a man with leprosy. So on Jesus' previous trip through Capernaum, he cleansed the temple, he healed the sick, he cast out devils. That means he ministered to the people and he met their needs and he blessed the people. Now he returns to Capernaum and there are needs present and there are problems. And that tells me that you are always going to need Jesus. Yesterday, you may have got everything fixed and all of your needs were met and you were blessed last Sunday. But guess what? It's a new day. And like the old song says, you need him more today than you did yesterday. It's interesting to me that Capernaum means village of consolation or comfort. It's also interesting that the place known as the village of comfort, there were all kind of problems. People were sick. They were afflicted. They were depressed. They were oppressed. And they were demon-possessed. It reminds me of the United States. We have the reputation of being a place of comfort. As a, a, a shining city on a hill. The place where dreams come true. The place where anything can happen where an immigrant can move to this country and start at the bottom and you can work your way to the top. Yeah. But just like Capernaum, we may have the name or the reputation, but the truth is there's a whole lot of devil in America. There's a whole lot of mess going on. There's a whole lot of pain and strife and division. And I wish I didn't have to say this, but I do. If there ever was a place that should be known as the village of comfort and consolation with a place where needs are met, the place where people are helped and lives are made better, it should be the church. This is the place where people ought to come to and their needs be supplied and their lives made better. Hallelujah. God forbid that they come to a church and they leave worse. I've known people that went in the hospital and left sicker than what they came. Because they picked up things there. I pray to God nobody will ever come here and be infected by somebody's nasty spirit. Oh God, let the Holy Ghost prevail. Let love prevail. Let compassion prevail. Let this be a house of mercy. But you know what's happened in America? A lot of churches have kicked the spirit and the anointing and the demonstration and the manifestation of the power of God out of the church. We don't want that anymore. We don't need that. And my question is this. How can you have the comfort of the Holy Spirit when you kick the comforter out of the church? What we need right now in America more than anything else is Jesus in the house. We need the comfort and the power of the Holy Ghost. We need the presence and power of an almighty God. We need Jesus more than we need social security. We need Jesus more than health insurance. We need Jesus more than we need padded pews and carpeted floors and good singing and good preaching and good teaching. More than coffee bars and light shows and smoke. We need more than theatrics in the church. We need the presence of a living God to permeate the atmosphere of this house. Because you can have all the above and not have his presence. And it's one thing to have a reputation that we are a place of comfort or the place where people can find rest and find healing and deliverance and freedom. But it's another thing for it to be manifested. And that requires the presence of Jesus and the power of the Holy Ghost. Everybody lift your hands and pray with me right now. Devil, you are a liar. In Jesus' name. Everybody get your mind on God. A lot of people have a picture of Jesus in their house. We got to have more than a picture. We've got to have the presence of Jesus in our house. We got to have him in this house. 
A picture of Jesus on the wall does not mean Jesus is in the house. Any more than wearing a cross around your neck means that Jesus is in your heart. We need Jesus in the house and the church has got to be more than a gathering place. Where we come on Sunday for an hour and a half. It must be a place filled with the manifest presence of Almighty God. Look, look what's going on around us. Terrorism is on the rise. The threat of nuclear war hangs over our heads. And the economy is in a global depression. And there's trouble everywhere. And the spirit of homosexuality and transgenderism and wokeism is invading our churches. And our hands are dripping with the blood of more than 70 million aborted babies. And sadly, the majority of the church is asleep. And we need a revival. And we need a revival of Jesus in the house. My God, I'm going to preach it till the devil has to back off because he's messing with me right now. He don't want you to hear this. We need Jesus in this house. We need him from the platform to the back wall to that sound booth to over here to over there in the balcony and everywhere else. We need Jesus. Somebody cry it with me. I need Jesus. Why? Because when Jesus is in the house, he changes things. He convicts of sin. He searches the heart. He cleanses the temple. When Jesus is in the house, liars quit lying. Drinkers quit drinking. Now, if you want some preacher to lie to you and pet you and tickle your ear, you're in the wrong place. I'm going to preach the truth to you. You're going to come to this church, you're going to hear it. What you do with it, that's between you and God. But I'm going to say it. You are not going to come to this church and be a sipper. When Jesus is in, the, is in the house, fornicators quit their fornicate. Oh. Well, don't preach like that, Pastor. I'll have to go find a church where they don't preach like that. You may have to. But this preacher is going to preach. Fornication will send you to hell. Adultery will send you to hell. Just buckle your seatbelt. It's fixing to get real turbulent. When Jesus is in the house, smokers quit their smoking. Oh, y'all don't want to hear that at all. Because I got to have my cigarettes and I got to have my tobacco. No, you don't. You need deliverance. And if you let Jesus touch your life, he will deliver you from that nasty habit. And he'll take it away from you. If anybody that, that's here that used to be addicted to nicotine, but God delivered you, wave your hand. You're looking at one. There's several in this house. God can do it. Somebody clap your hands. Somebody shout. When Jesus is in the house, thieves quit stealing. Gossipers quit gossiping. The lukewarm catch on fire. The sick get well. The bound get free. That's why we need Jesus here. There's a lot of things we don't need, but we need Jesus. His presence is everything. And the Bible says it was noise that he was in the house. And when Jesus is in the house, there's something to talk about. That's why verse 2 said straightway, many were gathered together in so much there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. When the house of God is full of his presence, the house will be filled with hungry people. And every pastor beats their head against the wall. How can I get people here? What program can we use? What gimmicks can we offer to get people in our pews? I'm going to tell you what. People are still seeking the reality of the presence and the power of Jesus Christ. When they come to this house, they don't need a show. They don't need religion. They don't need a form of religion. They don't need a church service. They don't need programs. They don't need just activities. Somebody give me Jesus. 
I'm dying. Somebody give me Jesus. My marriage is on the rocks. I need Jesus. I'm addicted to crack cocaine. Give me Jesus. I'm about to commit suicide. Somebody give me Jesus. God, they need more than a cup of coffee. They need to have an encounter with the one that can change their life. If you believe that, wave your hand at God and say, oh God, show up. Show up. Give me Jesus. The Bible said Jesus preached the word to them. Why, Why did Jesus need, need to preach the word to them? He was the son of God. He was the word incarnate because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you're never going to get anything without faith. Verse 3 says, they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Four men carried this man. I love this story. One of my favorite stories in the Bible because it shows us compassion and action. Thank God for those four men who brought this man to Jesus. A man who could not walk. And it's not written in the scriptures, but we have every reason to believe that these four men had somehow been, in, been helped by Jesus themselves. Possibly the last trip, the last time he visited Capernaum. It's very possible that they had experienced the miracle power uh, in their own lives. So they knew the power to save and to heal was with Jesus And this is what I love about this story. These four men who are not named were partners in this man's miracle. They could have been like a lot of people, only concerned about themselves. Us four, no more. Hey, I got my miracle. Hallelujah. I'm out of here. You worry about yourself. But they brought this man to Jesus. They carried him on a stretcher. And listen to me today, those of us who have experienced his presence, who know the power of God to save and to heal and to deliver, we should be actively involved in helping those who are still bound and oppressed and sick and afflicted and lost. We should be actively involved in helping get them to Jesus. That's why we need to be out in the highways and hedges and compelling people to come into this house that it may be filled. It's like that old song that that they used to sing, I know a man who can. I can't save your soul, but I know a man who can. I can't calm the storm in your life, but I know a man who can. And his name is Jesus. I can't fix your broken marriage, but I know a man who can. Is there a church in this house? Is there anybody that believes what I, I can't take cancer out of your body, but I know a man who can. I can't heal your affliction, but I know a man who can. I can't take the unnatural homosexual or lesbian appetites away from you, but I know a Jesus who can take that away from you and deliver you. Somebody wave your hand at God. Somebody give God praise. I can't open your blind eyes or unstop your deaf ears, but I know a man who can. Somebody say it with me. I know a man who can. I know a God who can. I know Jesus. He can do it. Somebody say, I know a man who can. Verse 4 says, when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, the crowd, let's stop right there. There's some things that you're not going to get without a fight. There's some things that won't come without pressing. There's some habits and addictions and lust of the flesh. There's some sicknesses and diseases and strongholds of the mind that are not going to change until you're willing to press. If it's worth having, it's worth fighting for. You know the story of the woman with the issue of blood. She had to get in the press. The Bible says in Matthew 5, when she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment, and she was made whole. She had to put forth the effort. She had to, she had to press through all the pressure. And verse 4 says, these men uncovered the roof. When they couldn't get to the door, they climbed on the roof, and they began to uncover it. Now, this is speaking about getting honest with God. 
You cannot have the presence and power of Jesus in your life with unconfessed sin in your heart. Hold on, it's getting tight. But it's right. Sin separates us from the power of God. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covers his sins shall not prosper. But whosoever confesses and forsaken them shall have mercy. Now I know you love your sin. And you love it so much you don't want to quit it. But you'll never have what God wants you to have as long as you're holding on to that thing. And getting up on the roof and uncovering it, that's talking about getting serious with God. Some of you need to get serious about your salvation. It's not playtime. It's not time to gamble. It's not time to wonder if I'm saved or not. It's high time to get in the church and get on fire and sell out to Jesus and say, I'm going to be saved. Getting serious with God. Ripping away anything that stands between you and the presence of Jesus. Will you let your pride keep you from Jesus? Will the opinion of other people, what somebody might think or say, keep you away from Jesus? Who cares what anybody thinks? The talkers are going to talk about you no matter what. Will you let religion and tradition keep you away from Jesus? Will you let bitterness keep you away from Jesus? To have the presence of God in your life, you've got to press. And so they let him down through the roof. That's a divine principle. If you want to if you, if you come up, you've got to go down. I said the way up is down in God's kingdom. Down in prayer, down in death to self, down in submission, down in obedience, down in humility. And then God will lift you up. Amen. Remember Naaman the leper, a very proud man? And he didn't want to go get dunked in the Jordan River because it was muddy. <laughs> he was humiliated. But when he went down, he came up clean and whole. And Jesus said, whosoever exalted himself shall be abased. And whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. First Peter 5, 6 says, humble yourself under the, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. That's the way it works. If you want to be lifted up, you've got to go down. When King Saul was little in his own eyes, God made him great and lifted him up and exalted him. But when he became big in his own eyes, God put him down. Amen. A preacher here that's here today you want the anointing you got to die first Kings second Kings chapter 13 verse 21 the Bible says they threw a dead man in a tomb where Elijah Elijah's bones were and when hit that dead man hit those bones he came back to life the anointing is for dead men in other words if you want to come up with the anointing you got to go down in death to your flesh that was free, but you take that and swallow it and believe it. Those four men knew if we can just get this man to Jesus, the presence of Jesus will change his life. In his presence, the blind see, the lame walk, and the deaf hear. In his presence, broken hearts are mended, marriages are healed, minds are restored. In his presence, that have held on for years are broken like a threat. In his presence, the dead are raised back to life. Does anybody believe what I'm saying? In his presence, there's peace, there's joy, there's faith, there's hope, there's love. In his presence, there's life. Oh, how we need the presence of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. First Chronicles 16, verse 27, glory and honor are in his presence. Strength and gladness are in his place. Psalm 16, 11, thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Church, that's where it's at. I've got to have his presence today. 
I need everybody in this house to lift your hands and your voice one more. I want you to send up a praise to God. God is trying to do something in this house. Hallelujah. Come on, lift up a voice of praise to the Lord. I worship you, God. Your presence is everything. Hallelujah. What else can we learn from this story? We learned that the man on the cot had a will to be well, and that hit that will caused him to submit his life to the hands of these four helpers. You have to will to be well. You have to have a focus. You have to have something you're aiming at. You have to have a want to. You have to want to be free. If you're here and you're bound, whether it be by drugs, alcohol, pornography, whatever addiction it might be, it doesn't matter what it is. God can break it. But guess what? You got to want to be free. You have to have a focus. You have to have something that you are aiming at. You have to want to be better. You have to want to be strong. You have to want to be happy. Don't come up here and ask me for prayer if you don't really want something. Prayer has to have a focus. And the power of God has to have a focus. God can do anything. Anytime, anywhere. But he only moves where there is a need, a desire, and faith. And faith cannot operate without a focus. And along with that will and that desire, you also have to see. You have to have vision. You have to see yourself delivered. You've got to see yourself clean and sober. You can go through all the eight-step programs till you die. They're not going to change you till you get a desire to be changed. You got to see yourself free from every habit and every addiction. You got to see yourself without that sickness in your body, without having to take pills every day and night, without having to go see doctors every week. You got to see yourself happy and smiling and enjoying life. You got to see yourself walking in the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. You got to see yourself being blessed. Well, I, you shouldn't want that. Yeah, you should want to be blessed. And if you don't want yours, amen, you don't want yours, God, get, it, get over here. Send it to me. You ought to see yourself with having more than enough money to pay your bills, with enough left over to be a giver. Amen. Just t turn to your neighbor and say, you've got to see it. God, thank you for three of you doing that. You've got to see it. That's why you're never going to have it, because you can't see it. Before the prodigal son ever left that pig pen, he stood up on the inside. He had already made the journey in his mind, Epi. He saw himself back at father's house, sitting around the table, eating good food. And he had already asked for forgiveness before he ever took a step toward home. He said, I will arise. And it began with a will to be restored. Arise. Stand up in your mind. Stand up in your thinking. Stand up out of your depressed thinking. Stand up in your emotions. Stand up in your faith. And when all these ingredients came together, Jesus looked at the man and said, You take up your bed and you go to your house. By the power of the word and the anointing of the Holy Ghost, you're about to take control, sir, of the thing that has held you bound. The thing that's pushed you around and dominated your flesh and tormented your mind. You're about to pick it up and walk out of here with it. By the presence of Jesus and his words, this man became the master of that which had held him. Thank you, Jesus. And so can you. And so will you in Jesus' name. I don't know what you need from the Lord today. But I do know who you need. That's Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. That's who you need today. You need his presence. 
Everything you need is in his presence. I'm going to tell you something before I shut up. You listen to this. There are many people in the Bible who would have died or would have remained sick, afflicted, oppressed of the devil if they hadn't put forth the effort to come to where Jesus was. They had to do that. They had to do that. And, and so often I can't even get people to make the journey from their seat to the front. And we wonder why we don't get our miracle. You wonder why there's no breakthrough. And you wonder why you don't change. When you're Velcroed to that pew and you won't even budge. If you want something bad enough, you'll go get it. And sometimes you just have to make up your mind. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get a breakthrough. I'll get in the press. I said, I'll get in the press. I'm going to tear the roof off. I'll risk public humiliation. I'll let them talk about me. I'll let them think what they want to think. I'll let the gossipers run their mouth. I don't care. If I needed a miracle today, I'd make sure I got to where Jesus is and I wouldn't care who's thought what about it. Come on, you're gonna, you, if you want a miracle, you'll shout if you have to. You'll run if you have to. You'll dance or whatever it takes to get in his presence. Because there's no price too high to have his presence in your life. His presence makes us whole. His presence makes the difference. His presence drives out darkness and drives out fear. That's why I need his presence. His presence is everything. Stand with me all across this house. Every eye closed, just get your mind on God. The devil, since the minute I started preaching, he has tried his best to stop me. He's had people walking in and out of this service after I asked you not to. He's had all kind of disruptions going on. And I don't care what the devil does and what he tries to do. God is in this place and he wants to help somebody get free today. Jesus is in the house. And when Jesus shows up, anything's possible. You need a miracle? Raise your hand all over the house. You need a change in your life? Raise your hand. You need, a, you need deliverance? You need freedom from an addiction? Raise your hand. Come on, don't be embarrassed. You think we're all people that were raised in this church? No, we were, we were drug addicts and alcoholics. We've been in prison. We've been everywhere you can imagine, but Jesus changed our life, and he can change your life. So the altar's open. Step out. Come. You, need, you just raised your hand. Now prove it. I need this. I need Jesus. I'm going to walk up here. I'm going to walk to the front of this church like the preacher says. And I'm going to believe that God is going to meet me there. And God's going to change my life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, quickly. Feel this altar. Quickly, run. Run down here. I wouldn't walk. I'd run down here. Let's go. Hallelujah. 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 She caught up on shot. Oh Jesus. Oh Jesus. Oh Jesus. You that have walked down here, lift your hands. Get your mind on God. And begin to worship the Lord with me right now. <laughs>